So uh, thank you for attending uh, today's event. So today is the first of the seminar series uh, of the Internet of Census Research Center. Okay. So uh, for those of you that are not aware of who we are, I, I thought I would just give it a very short introduction. Okay. So the Internet of Census Research Center is a newly established research center funded by the uh, Ministry of Education. So in fact, it's one of the few Stengen Tse Zhongxin at National Tsinghua University. Okay. So um, this center is led by uh, Professor uh, Zhang Linsang. Uh, my name is Peter Hong. I'm helping to uh, coordinate the administrator uh, uh, stuff. Okay. So uh, in this, uh, our research center has more of a, a metaverse theme. Okay. So we try to develop the technology necessary to um, for Internet of Senses, mainly to connect the various sensing modalities um, between different parts of the world. Okay, so we have three main focus areas, uh, including intelligence sensing and computing, uh, com communication and networking technology, and also augmented reality application. Okay, so we started with some applications in sports technology and content co-creation, but this certainly involves much more like things like robotics, you know, autonomous vehicles and things like that. Okay, so uh, today's talk, uh, today we have two talks, uh, both in the communication and networking area. Uh, one is by Professor uh, Xu Zhenxin, and the other will be by Professor uh, Liu Guanghao. Okay, so I, I believe that this, uh, we hope that this seminar series can serve as a really good platform uh, to let people know what we are doing at the research center and hopefully inspire um, some new ideas and uh, future research collaboration. Okay. Um, so before we begin, I would also like to thank uh, Light On Technology for supporting uh, part of the event today. All right. So uh, without further ado, uh, so we start with the first talk uh, by Professor uh, Xu Zhenxi. Uh, let's welcome Professor Xu. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Professor Hong, for the nice introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Chen Xin Su. Uh, I'm with the Department of Computer Science, as well as the Internet of Science Research Center, introduced by Professor Hong just now. So today I'm happy to share some of our recent work on immersive uh, cloud VR gaming. And before uh, introducing our work, I want to introduce a few terms that I use in the title, uh, which are gaming, VR, cloud, and immersive. To make sure that we are on the same page, okay? So first of all, uh, in terms of gaming, I'm talking, or I'm thinking of, uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, PC gaming mainly. And uh, uh, many of you play PC games, and you know that uh, the requirement of a recent PC game is getting higher and higher. So take the lower right corner, the example of Star Wars Jedi as an example. According to the uh, game developer, um, it require an, I think, NVIDIA 2070, at least uh, this type of GPU to play it. And uh, even I don't have this type of GPU. So for gamers who do not have a powerful machine, they may not be able to play this game at home. So one possible solution is to push this game into the cloud uh, data center, because uh, cloud data center has more computing resources. And then if the, we run the game at the cloud data center, capture the thing, encode the thing, and stream the thing in real time to the right-hand side, so even for people like me have an ordinary PC or laptop, uh, or even I only have a smartphone, I can play the same game. Uh, PC game or computer game, not only today's PC game and computer game, not only um, use the display like the regular 2D monitor as the display. We also have innova uh, innovative display such as uh, uh, the goggles where you put the display very close to your eye. So this type of uh, near eye display uh, may give us uh, a better experience while playing games. There are two types of uh, near eye display. Uh, upper left corner what I try to show you is a see-through goggle. Uh, example would be Microsoft HoloLens uh, where you can see you can still see the uh, reality. You can still see that you are in this conference room. But uh, on top of that, I can project some of the virtual objects, uh, like the Pikachu and the Dex. Okay. Um, by doing that, then uh, we said that we can achieve or we can deliver the augmented reality uh, experience. 
Another type of near eye display is uh, if I can block all your senses, then uh, I may have a chance to put the gamma in a totally different places in a virtual world. And this type of uh, display, we say uh, this is a VR head-mounted display. And today my talk will be focused on VR, uh, VR display. And uh, as you can see the bottom, uh, the horizontal line represents the reality and virtuality continuum. There are so many different types of uh, something reality. And more recently, people have given up and they just call the whole thing extended reality, okay, or XR. Uh, the last term I want to introduce is immersion or immersive experience. Uh, so from the word, immersion actually means throw a person into water and immerse you in the water. So in this context, what we want to do is to throw a gamer into a virtual world and make the gamer feel that he's in, he or she is in the virtual world instead of a physical world like this conference room. To achieve that, uh, there are two very important things uh, at the bottom. First one is realism. So if I show a bear, for example, in this room, the bear should look like a real bear. Okay? And the second thing is uh, uh, interactivity. Uh, we can interact with the physical world and we want to allow the user to be able to interact with the virtual world as well. Uh, there are different ways of interacting with the virtual world and the most important or fundamental one is interacting with the virtual world using the sensor on the head-mounted display. And there are, uh, there are three different uh, modes popular modes of interacting with the virtual world using your head-mounted display. From the left-hand side, we call it three degree of freedom, where the user or gamer can look at different positions or different directions, sorry. And for example, the user, the gamer can look at the ceiling and uh, inside the viewport of the head-mounted display, we should show the ceiling to the user or gamer. If the user look at the floor, we should show the viewport of the floor to the gamer. Okay, um, let's call three degree of freedom, left most one or three duff. Um, but three duff doesn't allow you to move, right? So of course you can move, but the viewport image is not going to change. If, uh, if you move to the right one step, it's going to, you are going to see the same thing. So which means uh, you may feel confused that I'm moving in the virtual world, but I don't see any differences. Uh, therefore, the eventual goal of VR application is to achieve six degree of freedom uh, where you also allow, or we also allow the VR gamers to move freely in the virtual world. And we are going to show, or we are going to render different uh, viewport based on the position of the user. Uh, so I have uh, defined most of the terms. So what we want to do is uh, to develop a cloud VR gaming system. And we want this system to be immersive, okay? Uh, and uh, on the video, or in the video, you see that uh, this is a cloud gaming system testbed that we built in our lab. And I think my student is uh, playing, Li Guanyu is playing uh, Angry Bird, I think. All right? And uh, the goal of uh, building this system is to provide immersive experience, right? And providing immersive experience over the internet is not an easy task because Gamer asks for a fast response time, which means if I move, I want to see the effect right away. Uh, but all the pack, you need to go back to the cloud server and come back to your head-mounted display, which is resource constrained, by the way. Uh, and you will also want to see high visual quality. So this is not an, uh, an easy thing to achieve immersive experience. And in today's talk, I'm going to introduce three projects quickly, uh, how we can uh, improve the quality of the cloud VR gaming. And uh, the first one is how can we leverage the human vision system. It's a fancy word to refer to your eyes and brain, basically. So we can leverage the characteristic of your eyes, and hopefully we can make your gaming experience better without incurring extra network overhead. The second thing is that internet is the best effort network, so we want to adapt to the network. Uh, if the bandwidth is higher, we want to utilize the bandwidth. Bandwidth is lower, we want to reduce the amount of data we send, uh, but we want the packet to arrive at the receiver side in time. Uh, in the third work, I want to do something slightly different uh, than pure cloud VR gaming. I want to allow more people to watch the gameplay. It's similar to the Twitch or uh, YouTube live game streaming. Uh, today's game streaming uh, actually allow, don't allow you to interact with the content. 
So you are, you are watching the game streaming in 2D format, right? And uh, pretty much you don't have the three degree of freedom or six degree of freedom I just mentioned. What if we want to allow the gamer, uh, sorry, not gamer, the viewer or observers to watch a gameplay in six degree of freedom? How can we do that? Okay. All right. So these are the three projects that I'm going to introduce. I will just jump right into the first project. Uh, how can we leverage human vision system uh, using so-called dynamic foveation? So, uh, what is the characteristic of uh, human vision si system? I just mentioned uh, can be shown at the lower left corner figure. Uh, in this figure, x-axis means the distance from our gaze point. So when we are looking at something, we, uh, our gaze is focusing on a single point. And surrounding this gaze point, uh, our, our, our eyes are very sensitive. And we can see a lot of details. But the peripheral region, we cannot see much detail. Okay? So the y-axis represents the sensitivity of our eyes. So the sensitivity drops quickly. Um, so this is one, uh, one property of a human vision system that we can leverage if we don't have enough network resources. So what we can do is the following. We divide the uh, viewport in the head-mounted display into two regions. The first one is the pink one, that is the foveal region, where they are closer to the gaze point. So human eyes are sensitive, so I allocate more bit rate to it. Uh, the other part is called peripheral region, so I allocate less bit rate to it. Okay. Uh, by doing that, by doing this, we call this foveation, and uh, hopefully we can use the same amount of bit rate, but increase the user experience. Uh, there are different ways to achieve fove uh, foveation. So one popular way to do that is called foveated warping. Uh, foveated warping does the following thing. Uh, we go to the peripheral, uh, peripheral region, and we reduce the number of pixels. We do downsampling in the peripheral region. And if we do downsampling, then relatively more uh, and then after that, we encode the whole image using a single 2D codec. And by doing that, because we have fewer pixels in the peripheral region, so the focal region quality will increase. Okay? So there are two ways of uh, doing uh, foveated warping. The first one is uh, static foveated warping, as I show you in the middle. Uh, it basically, oh, in the middle, basically means the focal region is in, right in front of the user, uh, in the middle of the head-mounted display viewport, or we can keep track of the user eyes moving the focal region, okay? Now, uh, we did a survey, we found that there is no existing uh, cloud VR streaming system that support dynamic foveation. Uh, so we decided to answer or ask three questions. The first one is, uh, does foveated, dynamic foveation help improve the gaming quality, okay, or gaming experience? The second thing is, uh, well, if it improves the gaming uh, experience, how can we make the whole system more efficient? You can think of more efficient means a higher frame rate. And the third question is, after I optimize our cloud VR gaming system, does, do the user, do the gamer perceive the differences? Do they feel the quality is even better? So these are the three questions that I want to answer in this project. This is the uh, architecture of the cloud gaming system. Left hand side is the server, right hand side is the client. The important thing is uh, we have a foveation module which will do the downsampling thing I just mentioned. And this module will take a few parameters. So we also have a reconfiguration module trying to figure out what's the best parameter to use. All right, so we start from an open source project called Airlight XR or short as uh, ALXR. And uh, this is a home streaming solution which allow you to use your home PC to run the VR game and stream it over the Wi-Fi to your head-mounted display. And we modify this system for uh, internet usage, and uh, we address a few limitations of this system. For example, it doesn't support eye tracker, so it doesn't know where you are looking at. So we enable eye tracker. The second thing is it only supports static foveation, assuming that foveal region is always in the, in the center of your viewport. So we, we modify the source code uh, so that we can support dynamic foveation as well. And the last one is uh, it doesn't allow you to dynamically adjust the foveation parameter, for example, where is the center of the foveal region. So we change all three of them. And then we use this modified uh, ALXR to run a user study trying to answer the research question one or the question number one 
uh, whether dynamic foveation is helpful. Um, so in the middle is the foveity warping uh, algorithm supported by ALXR. So you see the pink region is the fovo region. We can adjust the size of the pink region. All other colors representing peripheral region, and we can adjust the compression ratio they call it, basically down sampling degree of it. So we compare, uh, we compare 13 different settings, and we recruit, I think, uh, 17 users or subjects. We ask them to play a game called Fruit Ninja, and uh, they play this game under different scenario or in different scenario, and they will tell us what do they think about the visual quality using a rating between one to five, where one is terrible, five is perfect. Uh, we compare this stands for, on the left hand side, this stands for dynamic foveation, and S stands for static foveation. Uh, our finding is the following. First of all, if we choose the you know, intermediate or median value of the parameter, uh, it performs better than uh, other settings. Okay. So here, higher number is better. This is a so-called mean opinion score or average score of all the subjects, 4.67 out of 1 to 5, which is very close to 5, right? So this is better compared to other setting, so we found the best parameter setting. And the second finding is if I compare dynamic foveation on the right hand side versus the middle one, static foveation, we found that we can increase the uh, mean opinion score from 4.07 to 4.67. Uh, so this answers our first question. The second question uh, is uh, how can we improve the performance of the system? Um, so we try to think, the first thing is uh, initially there are some limitation in the LXR implementation. Uh, whenever we change the foveation parameter, we need to recreate an object, replace the old foveation module. So instead of doing that, we optimize the implementation and we allow the foveation module to be updated to be updated on the fly. So I can reduce the overhead, first of all. The second thing is, uh, uh, during our user study, many of the, some of the uh, subject told us that they can see the boundary between, if you remember, the pink FOBO region versus the peripheral region. They can see a line in between, right? Because they are encoded in different quality. Um, so we modify or we try another foveation method co-foveated uh, co radial warp. So uh, the idea is you don't have, no longer have two regions. So we just reduce the uh, point density from the gaze point toward the edge. So after we do this optimization, uh, we perform some uh, measurement study. And the key takeaway or comparing the unoptimized versus optimized system, the key takeaway is uh, we can reduce uh, the response time, response time means the user move until the user see the, the, the impact of his movement. We can reduce the response time uh, by five times, and we can also increase the frame rate um, by 2.5 times. Okay, so this answers our second question. And the third part is uh, we want to understand whether user sees the differences. And this time we no longer ask, we ask more than visual quality, we ask even more questions such as the immersive level, do you feel you are immersed in the virtual environment or in the VR game? And we also ask at the bottom you see the cyber sickness, uh, do you feel dizzy after playing the game? Okay, I will skip the detail, uh, but just say that uh, after optimization we improve the quality of the system in all aspects. Uh, for example, immersion level will increase it by 2.11 point between 1 to 5, okay? So which is a, a huge improvement. And here's a demo showing the optimized system on the left-hand side and right-hand side optimized the system. So you show that left-hand side, the frame rate is lower. And hopefully you can see it. Right-hand side, the frame rate is almost 70 frame per second. So this is uh, the first project I want to talk about. Basically, we use dynamic foveation to improve the gamer experience without uh, using more bandwidth, okay? Then I will jump to the second project. The second project, what we are going to do is uh, we want to adapt to the network condition during a game session. So if you are playing a game, uh, network condition may change. How can the system adapt to the uh, network condition change, okay? 
So uh, the same system, but uh, previously I didn't emphasize the networking part. So in this part, in this project, we uh, emphasize or we focus on the networking part. Okay, right. So earlier I mentioned that VR gamers they ask for short response time and high visual quality, and because of that, we need to allocate or we need to distribute our resources in a good way so that the gamer will actually feel the gaming experience is good. But this is not easy because internet is the best for network. Um, so what would happen if some of the packet arrive at the receiver side too late, right? So I render uh, the uh, two video. Left hand side is uh, what if I have network latency? Then some of the video packet may arrive late, then the client cannot show anything. So that's why you see on the left hand side video, you see some black region because the client didn't receive the packet. On the right hand side is if we don't have a uh, network delay, then everything is fine. So in this project, what we did is uh, uh, we tried to uh, solve this problem in a three-step approach. Uh, the first one is we run a user study similar to what I, uh, what I introduced in the first project, and we try to understand, uh, we try to collect a bunch of samples, and this sample will allow us to build a QoE model. So what do I mean by QoE model? Uh, there are some metrics that I can measure, like the round trip time, like the latency, like the packet loss rate, uh, like available bandwidth, things like that. So this can be the input uh, into my QoE model, and hopefully I can predict the gamer quality, right? Uh, gamer experience, sorry. Uh, if I can predict the gamer experience and I'm limited by a certain amount of resources, such as bandwidth, then I can wisely choose the parameter that I can adjust at the center side so that I can maximize the uh, gamer experience. Okay, so that's what we uh, did in this project. And uh, uh, again, the architecture, but here we are focusing on the right hand side. We build a QoE model and then we build a, or we design a dynamic adaptation algorithm adapting to the network dynamic. So we will st still start with uh, user study because I uh, understand how what users think is important, but in this project, we consider three different games with different. Uh, characteristic. The first one is Angry, uh, Angry Bird. It's a, it's a slow path uh, leisure game. The uh, second one is a fast path be saber, require very fast response time. And the third one is, uh, is a puzzle game, require very high visual quality. Uh, all right, so we design our user study and try to change as many parameters or factors as possible. So here are the list of the uh, parameters that we change, and we recruit uh, a bunch of uh, uh, gamers, ask them to play the game in different setting, and we ask these questions. Okay, similar to what I show you in the first project, um, but the details are slightly different. Uh, we have the overall quality and specific, uh, you know, QoE question. Uh, this is a procedure of uh, running the experiments, and I will skip this part. Now, after we run the user study, it took us uh, a few weeks to run the user study, we get a bunch of samples. Then we can use that sample to build a QoE model. Left hand side are the factors input to the QoE model, uh, including system, content, and human factor. On the right hand side, we want to predict uh, what is the overall quality, what is the visual quality, and immersive level. Okay? And here I list all the factors that we consider. Uh, one minor detail is I consider three different games. These games are different, so we need a matrix to describe how they are different. Um, temporal information and spatial information are two metrics coming from MPEG group, basically describing uh, how many details in the spatial in each of the frame and how many details in the across the frame. Okay? We also consider the QMAN, um, whether they are experienced in VR or gaming or not. So we try different uh, regression model. Eventually, we found random forest works the best. And we also try to build a model for each of the game, or we build a general model using TISI as the uh, input. We only get one model that works for all the game, and we found the difference is small. So we decide to use a general model. Um, and then they work quite well in terms of R square. Uh, we have 0.85 in terms of a correlation coefficient coefficient correlation, uh, coefficient correlation. We have 90, 0.93 and 0.92 in terms of Pearson as well as uh, Spearsman. All right. 
Using this QE model, then uh, we can build our uh, algorithm trying to determine what is the best bit rate, frame rate, and resolution at any moment. Uh, we assume that we are given a, a capital B, that's the bit rate budget, and we also uh, assume there is a networking overhead 15%. Um, the, the idea, core idea of the algorithm is uh, because we need to make the decision in real time, so we pre-build a model. Okay, to build a lookup table, basically. At the runtime, we just need to look up the table and find a solution, which will take us 20 milliseconds. Here's a comparison. Left hand side is no adaptation. The middle one is LXR, and you can see some of the black region, and right hand side is our method. And then after we have our algorithm, we also run yet another user study trying to identify or compare our adaptation algorithm. Is it better? Then the DTA is a threshold-based method used by ALXR, and uh, I think NA means that there is no adaptation. So the main takeaway is uh, we improve the left-hand side's overall quality, right-hand side's visual quality um, by a considerable uh, gap. And uh, we also increase the, uh, increase the interactive quality, which means it's more responsive. And we're looking to the network traces, and we found that because we send less amount of traffic, we uh, mitigate the network congestion, and actually the round trip time is lower in our case. So this is my second project, okay? And uh, I will quickly jump into my third project, okay? Uh, the third project is about streaming 3D content so that I can enable six degree of freedom. And here, the 3G, 3D content we chose to use is 3D point cloud. So 3D point cloud uh, basically is a bunch of points, and there is no surface between the points, therefore you need a lot of points to, re to represent each of the objects. Uh, typically, you have half million points. Because you have so many points, you need to compress them. Once you compress them and send it over the network, you may suffer from packet loss. Once you have packet loss, then you will have degraded uh, rendered view, as I show you at the bottom. Okay? Uh, therefore, uh, we're looking to the possibility of conceal this type of error by analyzing nearby frame and trying to come up with the missing frame. We try to interpolate the missing frame. Uh, I wouldn't get into the detail of this project, but I would just say that we propose a pipeline. And inside this pipeline, we identify a few major tasks that uh, any of the concealment algorithms need to perform. And the idea is uh, the user can propose different algorithms for each of the stage. For example, point matching stage is the second stage. Compare two frames, match each point to any other point because point cloud is unordered. We don't know which point match to which point. So you first need to match the point. Stage number three is compute the motion vector or optical flow. And uh, stage number four is to predict the missing frame. OK? All right. So uh, once you have algorithm for each of the stage, then we can mix and match and create different pipeline. Um, we recommend four different pipelines and uh, for different usage scenario. For example, if you want to have a very fast uh, pipeline, then you can go with the first row. If you want to have a high quality pipeline, you can go with the third row. And I will skip most of the detail and just show the simple video. Uh, this is a concealment result. So for a video, for every six frames, we drop five of them, five consecutive frames. And then we get the next frame that is successfully received. And we try to conceal the five missing frames. Uh, rightmost one is the quality-based pipeline or quality, or we call it pipeline Q, aiming for highest possible quality. The middle one is uh, 3D FC, if uh, frame copy, FC stands for frame copy. If I don't receive a point cloud, so I just replay the previous point cloud, hopefully you see that 3D FC is less smooth compared to our pipeline Q. Uh, like many other problems, people have proposed um, solving this uh, error concealment, not exactly error concealment, but interpolation problem using neural network. And we also tried two neural network solutions at the middle. And you can see that it doesn't uh, perform as good as our pipeline queue because there are a few holes uh, appear uh, in the concealed uh, avatar. Okay? So this is uh, my last project. Uh, we did error concealment of 3D point cloud. So this is what I have presented today. I introduced what is uh, dynamic foveation. I also introduced how we use QOE modeling. 
uh, to adapt to the network condition. And last, I show how we do error concealment for 3D point cloud. Uh, of course, there are a few future directions that we can work on, for example, to achieve six degree of freedom. Uh, so what I just show you is a streaming point cloud, left, second left one. Uh, and more recently, people have proposed different 3D representation, for example, using neural network for the nerve, or using an extension of 3D point cloud called 3D Gaussian splatting. And we are also looking into this, uh, how can we use this in cloud VR streaming or broadcasting more specifically. Um, so here I create a table showing different uh, type of system. Different systems may have different requirements where a solid dot means uh, it requires that. A uh, circle means it doesn't require it. So as you can see at the bottom, cloud VR gaming requires high quality, high uh, short latency, and it's sensitive to the bandwidth. So I think what we design, the mechanism we design for cloud VR gaming can be used in other similar systems where the requirement or uh, the resource consumption or resource constraint is uh, less limited. Okay, so this concludes my talk. And I'm ready to take questions, if any. Thank you very much. So, uh, sorry, I didn't give much introduction to Professor Shea at the beginning, but as you can see, he has done you know excellent work on mobile uh, uh, multimedia networking. Right, one of our top uh, professors in this field. Um, so, I was wondering if you have any questions. So, yeah, oh, okay. Um, 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 你看不出差别,对不对?就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉,就是感觉
uh, the encoding rate for two reasons. Uh, one is, of course, there is a latency in between, right? The second thing is because we change the encoding parameter, and you don't want to change the encoding parameter too much. Otherwise, the video will become unsmooth. People will detect that quality changes too often. So in that project, I think we set the system parameter of how often we adjust the encoding setting is a three second. It's a empirical determined three second, but of course the user can always change that. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and also in the last work on error concealment, um, so in your experiment, you're considering like uh, you're missing five frames yes. for every six, right? right? So that, that, that's a lot, right? So right. I keep getting this question from our colleagues from telecommunication because they uh -huh. say if you have a system like this, no one will buy your system. <laughs> uh, we just want to make it more extreme, testing our method whether it will work in a very extreme cases. Right? So I, I guess for a commercial system, it probably will not provide this type of service if you have that high packet loss or friend loss rate. But that is frame loss rate, right? So for each of the frames, it will be divided into multiple packet. Even if I just lose one or two packet belong to that frame, there's a very high chance, especially today's MPEG codec, that the receiver cannot decode that frame. So the receiver may give up and say, decoder may give up and say that I cannot decode frame number 10, for example. And then we need to recover or conceal frame number 10. And, and you're considering more of a regular error pattern, right? So. Um, how how is the method affected by like, irregular patterns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes short, sometimes long. R right, right. Uh, this is our ongoing work actually. <laughs> so we were doing we are using some of the uh, some of the simulator trying to generate the packet loss pattern and trying to map it to the frame loss rate pattern and uh, understand whether we really need this or we can just uh, similar to the question from the another student. Uh, whether we can just replay the previous 3D frame. Maybe it's enough, we don't need the air okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so for, for the interest of time, uh, let's uh, thank Professor Chief. Thank you.